Greetings riders, Nick here with Pegasus Motorcycle Tours and Consulting, coming to you live from one of the best, highest roads in Europe, the Sommelier Pass in Italy, bordering France. Check this out. We're here for about the third time, if I remember correctly, uh, as part of our brand new web episode series called Epic Rides, dedicated to bringing you some of the most iconic, beautiful, and memorable rides that we have experienced ourselves, in hopes that they inspire you to hop on the bike and take yourself there, experience it for yourself. This epic ride is best attempted in August when most of the old snow has had the chance to melt and when it's still too early for new snow to prevent the climb to the summit. At the top is this gorgeous little turquoise lake that I purposefully excluded in this video because you should experience it for yourself. It should be your gift for making it to the top. It's one of the highest roads in Europe. Nestled between impressive granite peaks at just around 3,000 meters, that's about 150 short of 10,000 feet in altitude. The road was officially opened in 1962 and is named after Germain Sommelier, the engineer who's also responsible for the impressive 13 kilometer Freyus rail tunnel connecting France and Italy, which starts in the ski town of Bardonecchia, where this road also begins. Bardonecchia is actually quite uh, interesting and. Can I say something? Don't say Bardonecchia. How do you say? Bardonecchia. Bardonecchia. On a little aside, utilizing the modern Freyus tunnel will cost you 45 euros one way and about 60 for a return voyage, so keep that in mind. Should you wish to avoid these expensive 10 minutes in the tunnel, you have a few attractive and scenic options that will cost you at least an hour more, but are well worth the detour. For example, you can ride around the Lac de Montseny, which offers some exceptionally dramatic scenery, or you can ride up the Nevanche Valley towards Grenoble. All names mentioned can be found in the description below to help you plan your route. This is a 26 kilometer route. Six kilometers or four miles of which are fairly poorly paved. The rest is a decent wide dirt road up to this valley at 2,200 meters. That's about 7,200 feet. And then that part, as you can see, all the way up to the top for another 1,000 meters. The road narrows and becomes much, much more advanced and technical in nature with steep, unforgiving serpentine drops that are known to be washed out due to snowmelt and landslides. Thus, this road is fit for a more competent and dedicated ADV rider. I did this on a KLR 650, it was a little switchy because the boulders up top get a little big and they kind of tend to twitch your front wheel in not too comfortable ways because there really is just a sheer drop for a few hundred meters of switchbacks. My suggestion is not to be like the ill-prepared, albeit polite, German crew of three who started going up fairly late in the day, got a flat, and then realized that not only did they not have the spare tube, but between the three of them, they did not have the tools to repair any potential problem with, nor have any of them ever changed a tower before. So this experience inspired me to create another video that I discuss precisely what kind of tire kit you ought to carry on your bike at all times in order to keep your bike rolling along, so please stay tuned for that. This epic ride is very popular in the summer with overlanding vehicles and ADV riders and it takes about 45 minutes to an hour from the town of Bardonecchia to reach this gorgeous valley where in the spring numerous waterfalls from the melting snow form and create these idyllic crystal clear streams. If you come here in June there'll be about seven or eight big waterfalls. The views are spectacular. Along the way as you climb you will pass a nice little village called Rochemont followed by an alpine dam. A perfect place to take a break, relax, give yourself some time to acclimatize to the altitude. Never underestimate the pressure and the headaches that could cause. So give yourself some time. Uh, there's plenty of spaces to camp and running water. Uh, you can drink the water straight from the stream. Climbing up to this valley here, you can grab yourself a typical Alpine meal, heavy in fat, consisting of polenta, sausage, and cheese typically. This Refugio Scarfiotti now also serves German beer, as well as offering coffee and even Wi-Fi. Also, 
the Argentine chef blast salsa and merengue, so that too is a welcome rest for the ears. This is a fairly new thing because when I was here in 2013 for the first time, not only was I the only person on this whole mountain the entire day, but that particular year in late June, I wasn't able to continue any higher than this valley because this little serpentine was full of snow. I actually camped out on this field and it was the, one of the most memorable nights of best sleep that I could imagine high up in the mountains. I originally intended to go south following the Mediterranean coast of France. However, in Turin, I met a man who just so happened to be the driver for one of the teams racing at the Ferrari Challenge, which takes place immediately before the iconic 24-hour Le Mans. So he was kind enough to offer me a VIP pass to the races, and so I headed north instead. Unfortunately for him that year, his Ferrari would not let him finish, but very tragically for another racer, the 34-year-old Danish driver, Alain Simonsen, lost his life in the early laps when his Aston Martin slammed into the guardrails. That year also saw the first use of electric Audis, which the rowdy crowds of mostly French and British fans did not receive too well at all. They claimed it sounded much like a vacuum cleaner, and honestly, I would agree. If you end up visiting Le Mans by motorcycle, which I highly recommend, you will likely camp out across the street from the entrance at the field of horse stables that are converted to accommodate the huge crowds. Although my pass had better accommodations, I needed to be closer to my bike and to catch up on some maintenance. So I ended up tagging along this really great group of Brits who caravan down to the races every few years in their Morgans. I camped at the stables and also managed to clean a few of the mountain Texas Hold'em which consequently funded my return trip and my second attempt at Col de Sommelier later in August. After five weeks of roaming through northern France, visiting Paris, cruising the coast of Normandy and meditating above the bunkers on Omaha Beach and being inspired by the beautiful Mont Saint-Michel and as well as dodging some pretty insane storms through the rural center of the country, I managed to get to Spain. Then crossing the high mountains of the Pyrenees in Basque Country, I had a fairly severe crash that cracked my radiator. But this is a, another story entirely. One that would actually very decidedly change the direction of my life from then on, which ultimately led to my thesis field research deep in the Amazon jungle. We'll save that story for another time. However, suffice it to say, you would do yourself a grave injustice to live a life and never ride up the mighty Amazon. Or to be more precise, to canoe down the river that feeds a river that feeds the mighty Amazon and see that even in these deepest, most remote parts of the planet, there are still brave and very capable people surviving in this extremely hostile and dangerous environment. One has to respect that. So after some repairs, I was able to continue through Portugal where the city of Porto literally blew me away. Uh, the seafood is just awesome. The streets are beautiful and romantically colorful and mass tourism has still not completely altered the soul of this ancient metropolis. From the very windy southern tip of Portugal, I continued to Seville, up the curvy Mediterranean coast of France through Malaga, Granada, Valencia, and finally to Barcelona, where I spent a few days to rest up and get to know the city. After that, I continued north through Andorra and along the southern coast of France, Monaco, and through the gorgeous Verdun Canyon. Continuing north in this part of France, you have two amazing canyon options the D2202 and the D28. Choose between the two or ride them both, you won't be disappointed. I finally arrived at this majestic valley of the Sommelier Pass again in August, where nonetheless, the very last 200 meters were still completely covered with a few feet of snow. Before attempting the Sommelier Pass, my main suggestion is to give yourself some time to acclimatize to the altitude. Don't underestimate the fact that your body needs time to adapt, especially if you come over from the central part of France, which is flat or mildly hilly and relatively low. You can do this by taking a day or two and enjoying the little town of Bardanecchia, which is a playground both in the winter, having hosted the 2006 Winter Olympics, as well as in the summer. There are plenty of attractions. Some are mountain biking, rock climbing, hiking, and exploration of numerous forts that top virtually every surrounding peak one of which is a military museum. In July, 
The Campos Mit Ski Lift takes you up to the highest classical music concert in the world. Incredible Lago Verde in neighboring France is a short but beautiful hike away and definitely worth a visit. There too, you will pass through a quaint French village of Nevanche with its own refuge that now also seems to offer food, internet, and inexpensive rooms for the night should you need that service. If you're here in July, you can time it with the 18th and 19th stages of the Tour de France which take place along the D1091 and the D902 roads. Know that motorhomes with flags representing the entire world align these alpine passes, so be prepared for some traffic. Other things to consider is that avalanches and rock slides are fairly common in the area. In fact, this month, July of 2019, the Refugio Scarfiotti had to be evacuated after a landslide. Also, be aware of the large white sheepdogs and stay as far away as possible. They're not trained to be docile pets. Uh, they're trained to keep the herd protected from wolves. Just goes to show that mountains like this require full respect and full confidence in you being a fully self-sufficient rider. Be confident in your abilities to keep the bike running and be prepared to spend a night or two in the valley if it doesn't all go as planned. Start climbing early and keep in mind that temperatures fall drastically at night, even in the summer months. Also, in the vicinity there are numerous roads you simply must ride. One of which is the ancient Roman road called Strada della Sieta that rides for about 34 kilometers, that's around 21 miles, along the top of a ridge of a mountain range that never dips below 2,000 meters in altitude and has continuously gorgeous views. This old dirt road ends at Strada del Finestre, also known as Strada Provinciale 172, which is a world famous collection of paved switchbacks. But this ride is epic enough in itself, so we will save that for another episode of our new web series titled Epic Rides. In the description, please find the names of all the locations that I've mentioned. And if you need further assistance with route planning, etc., please don't hesitate to ask. Also, please participate in the conversation. What is your most iconic and favorite road that you can remember? I'm very curious to know. I'm always curious to ride the best roads in the world. So please share your comments and participate and let's spread the word. In the next episode of our Epic Ride series, we'll take you to the truly alien landscapes of Southern Utah with the introduction to one of the most psychedelic riding experiences I've ever had. The topic will be the White Rim Road, 71 mile long unpaved four wheel drive road below the island in the sky mesa of Canyonlands National Park. This is near the town of Moab. The road was constructed in the 1950s by the Atomic Energy Commission to provide access for individual prospectors intent on mining uranium deposits for use in the nuclear weapons production during the Cold War. As beautiful as this road is, it can be very difficult and deadly dangerous with sweltering desert heat, little to no shade, no communication coverage if in need of assistance, sheer drops that can be hundreds of meters high, and practically no accessible water. That is, of course, until insane storms sweep through and flash floods destroy the roads. This road is reserved for experts because mistakes or injuries along this stretch of holy land can easily cost a man his life. As easily now in the age of iron horses as when real cowboys roamed these lands. Thank you for watching. This has been another production by Pegasus. We hope that it has been helpful and informative. Please remember to like, subscribe and hit that notification bell 
and also please share it with your writing community so that we can help this channel grow and help bring you more videos like this. In the meantime, Nick, I'm out.